Father, we do pray that you would just do a great work in our hearts continually. And uh, we do pray for our nation. We know that the answer isn't in government. This is a hard issue. And uh, we need people to come to the truth and be saved from their sin. And then we need those who are saved to, to live in obedience. We need a spiritual awakening in our land. We need a revival among God's people. We know that only you can bring that about. We pray that you would just be working in the hearts of the people of our nation. We know that some of these things wouldn't be going on if their hearts were in the right direction. Father, we do pray for those who are away from us today for their safety. We also pray that their hearts would be right, that if at all possible, they can find a place to worship and uh, to be a blessing where they are. We do pray for this uh, wedding today and these two weddings. We, one was mentioned in Sunday school for the Cokes uh, relatives down in Texas and then Maria and Jake over in Minnesota. We do pray that the weather will cooperate and everything else. We pray that COVID won't be an issue. And uh, more than that, we do pray for those marriages. They would turn out to be godly marriages that honor you. And Father, we do pray for each one of our people, some that can't be with us for other reasons. And we pray that you'll encourage their hearts this day. May they sense your presence and your love. And I pray, Father, that each one who has come would receive a blessing and also be a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Anybody else ever notice that in the hymnal there's a 779 and then there's a 779B? And it's not the same melody or anything, it's just two totally different songs and instead of giving one a new number, they just give it a letter. But that was interesting. We have some birthdays coming up this week. Uh, one of them is today, uh, Janet Walker, she and I will be here. Um, tomorrow, I believe, or is it Tuesday, is Amanda Brown's birthday? It's Tuesday? Congratulations, hopefully. Um, and then Wednesday is George Montgomery's birthday. And I don't think there was any anniversary, so we're going to sing happy birthday to you guys. Uh, if you see George or Janet uh, throughout the week, make sure you wish them happy birthday, but Amanda's here today. We're going to sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you, happy birthday to you. Glory got it right, this is good. Hold up. Um, quick update, um, I usually, I realized I didn't do this last week, but I give you guys an update on youth group when I leave music. Um, we've been doing a series on discipleship, um, talked about what it means to be disciple than what it means to disciple others. Um, talked about um, Jesus' warning of the, the dangers of it, but the importance of discipleship and how it's important for growth, for developing a study, uh, biblical foundation for developing new leaders and also following the example that Jesus gave. Uh, we went through the characteristics and how to find somebody to help disciple you. And then we switched over to uh, what it looks like to disciple others because I'm sure a lot of these kids as they think about discipleship they're thinking it's just their time to follow but they're not much younger than the disciples would have been when Jesus gave them the Great Commission so I expect some of them to hopefully start doing some discipling here soon um, and then we're ending with uh, looking at when Jesus washed the disciples feet and last week we talked about it from looking specifically at uh, Peter's reaction to Jesus trying to wash his feet and this last next week we're going to close out the series looking at Jesus's um, actions and focusing on his response and what he told the disciples after he got done washing their feet in John chapter 13 so that's what we've been doing then we'll have two weeks and then we'll be a senior high camp and then so 22 days till senior high camp eight days till junior high camp 
We got 14 kids going. His Parker Crooks made it off the wait list. He's in officially. So we have 10 guys, I believe, and four girls. So uh, 14 senior hires. We only have two going to junior high this year. Um, be in prayer for that group. I think pretty much all of them have made a profession of faith. There's only one or two I'm not 100% sure about. So yeah, should be an awesome week. I look forward to it. 780 in your hymn rolls. We'll sing the first and the last verse. <laughs> Stand as we sing. I apologize. I made up my mind a little late. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, forever waves of rain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed.
Thank you, Sarah. <coughs> Sarah used to help out at the camp for a special camp, and we sure miss her there, but this year, we were not able to have special camp at all, Sarah. And um, one of the reasons that is, is a lot of our campers are uh, in that age group that is highly susceptible and besides their physical condition makes them very vulnerable so uh, I didn't initially want to share the other side of this but a lot of the counselors are in that age group that are supposed to be susceptible too so no special camp this year but uh, once you do it, you just love it, don't you, Sarah? Yeah. And I, and I really miss that I didn't get to go to camp this year. If you take your Bibles this morning and open them to 2 Timothy chapter 2, we'll be looking at two verses. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verses 1 and 2, and I would ask you when you found that, that you stand please, and we'll read it together in unison. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Still some pages turning, so we'll give you just a moment. Find your place. 2 Timothy 2. 1 and 2. I think we're there. Let's read it together. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Father, we do pray that we'll get the true sense of your word this morning and not just what it means but what it means for our lives for the ministry for the gospel and I pray that your spirit would be doing work in each and every one of our hearts and I pray in Jesus name amen you may be seated I appreciated uh, Paul's review of what they've been studying in their youth group and uh, today's message goes right along with that uh, it wasn't planned that way at least by us God has his own timing and his own plans but uh, in this passage the Apostle Paul is stressing to Timothy as he's continued to stress to him the importance of the true gospel but not only the fact that you have a true gospel, but he's also stressing the importance of the true gospel and effectively making sure it continues to spread. And so he tells him how to carry about spreading this true gospel. And he makes it in a tense in the Greek uh, in this first verse, and this whole thought carries over into the second verse. Thou therefore, my son, keep strengthening, if you will, the present imperative, meaning a continuous action, and it's a command to be strong or to be strengthened. Keep being strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You should encourage and participate in the continual and effective spread of the true gospel. Now let me say that again. You should encourage and participate in the continual and effective spread of the true gospel. So the apostle is indicating that this should be something that is continual, but there is an effective way of doing this and he's looking for the most effective way for the gospel to continue to spread. And so the apostle 
shows how in these verses. In the first verse, we've already started to build on this thought of continuing, but notice he says continually be strengthened. So continually increase in more spiritual power from the true gospel. It's just not a one-time thing that you get all the strength that you need in order to understand the true gospel and to be able to share that true gospel and even to live it out. It's a lot like an athlete. Now if an athlete is going to compete, he knows it's important that he's prepared through pop proper disciplines. And so he'll go through these disciplines to make sure that he's a good athlete for the time of his competition. Now some of the things that a good athlete will do as part of their discipline is their diet. And I'm not talking about diet pop either. It's a proper diet. And uh, they'll eat some of the goofiest things or refrain from eating certain things in order to prepare themselves for competition for their athleticism. Another thing is they have a regime. They, they have a schedule and uh, they have a program that they follow on a consistent basis in order to train properly. And so, and part of that regime is a proper diet, but, uh, you know, an athlete finds that if he only has a proper diet for a few days, that doesn't really work out so well. Uh, you have to continue this regime, and not only that, it's a thing of exercise. Now, spiritually speaking, if you're going to be strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, there is a proper diet, and the diet is the true gospel. Now, the Apostle Paul had already indicated to Timothy that he had given the true gospel because God was the one who had given him that gospel, and being an apostle, he shared the true gospel. He knew there would be those who would share a false gospel, an incomplete gospel, a twisted gospel, or even attack the true gospel. And he's saying all throughout this time, Timothy, you need to be a stalwart, bold, and strong advocate for the truth. And in order to do that, you need to be in the truth. You need to have your diet as the truth of the Word of God. And I tell you what, if you're going to be strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, you have to be in the Word of God. That has to be your continual diet. You'll find that people, when they stray from the truth and when they stray from the Lord, have not been faithful in being in the Word of God. And not just reading it, but actually getting in there and finding out what's in there and digesting it. Continue to dig into the Word of God. Now, there are some passages I want to go to that uh, indicate that this is something that needs to be done in other uh, passages of Scripture. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 32, as the Apostle Paul had uh, visited these places and he was getting ready to uh, head off to Rome. He calls uh, some men together. And in, in chapter 20, verse 32, he says this, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace. which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. To strengthen you, to build you up, it is the word of God's grace. And the Apostle Paul says, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Where do we find that grace? Well, we find it in the word of God. 
you go to 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 15 through 18. 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 13 or 15 through 18. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, or they twist. There are those who don't really know the truths. They're ignorant of the truth. They'll take the Word of God and they'll twist these things. But it says, as they do also other the Scriptures, unto their own destruction. When you twist the Word of God to make it fit what you want or to what you think it ought to be according to your own ideology, your own thinking, then you're destroying yourself. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfast, but grow in grace. And in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. How do you grow in this grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Will you dig into the Word of God? You see, there you gain your spiritual nourishment and there you find the application so that you can live it out. You, you give your obedient exercise to it. An athlete not only has to eat right and know what he's supposed to do, he needs to put it in application and exercise it. And so the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, grow in grace... Uh, or be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and to do that you need to feed yourself the Word of God you need to dig into it and give your obedience to it but notice this isn't all dependent upon Timothy it's not dependent upon us as well uh, it, really our dependence is upon the Lord the grace is the free provision of God that is in Jesus Christ. God provides what you need to be strengthened to carry out the true gospel and to spread it. See, many times we know that something needs to be done and we'll try to accomplish that in the power of our own flesh. We'll come up with formulas, we'll come up with resolutions and, and and promises and I'm going to do this for you Lord and and I resolve to do this and all of those things without the enabling grace of God will go nowhere they will fail but the Apostle Paul says you find the key to victory and success in the grace that is in Christ Jesus how does that grace work? Well, he shows you what needs to be accomplished, how it can be accomplished through the Word of God, and the agent that he uses to fulfill it in our lives is the Holy Spirit of God. God, by his Holy Spirit, will give you the grace, and he'll do that by taking the Word of God and guiding you. By the way, uh, professors in college made this point very strong, and we need to make it too. The Holy Spirit of God will never lead you contrary to the Word of God. So if somebody says they're being led by the Spirit of God and it doesn't match up with Scripture, you know that they haven't got it right. Now, this is especially true of pastors and spiritual leaders, but it shouldn't be true only of the pastors and spiritual leaders. He is speaking to Timothy, who's leading the church, and so it's very important for the pastor to be strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus on a continual basis. So, 
Pray for your pastor or pastors and your teachers. Continual spiritual strengthening for sharing the true gospel. We have not finally arrived to a perfection. And we have not arrived to the place where we do not continually need more and more strength in the grace of God. Pray for your spiritual leaders. That God will continually strengthen them in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then also ask God to help you trust Him for power and for the discipline for spiritual growth in the true gospel. You need that power as well. And you need to ask God to give you that power and for the discipline that you need on your part that God will work that out in your life so that you will grow in the true gospel and then set about in God's grace to follow the disciplines for spiritual growth in the gospel. Now the second thing that is very important we find in verse 2 and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. Now these witnesses some will say this happened at Timothy's ordination or his baptism and there were witnesses there that, and the, all the things that he heard probably in that short period of time didn't take place only at Timothy's ordination or at Timothy's baptism. All these truths of the true gospel. Now I would remind you that Timothy spent a lot of time with the Apostle Paul on his missionary journeys. <coughs> So it would include probably the things that uh, the Apostle Paul initially taught him when he led him to the uh, saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It would probably include those things, I'm, I'm certain it include those things at his ordination and at his baptism. But these witnesses throughout time were the ones wherever they went and shared the gospel. You know, the Apostle Paul started uh, quite a few churches throughout the region, and even when the church wasn't fully completed, there was still a continual witness given and a teaching given. And I'm sure that even when they didn't have public meetings, there were private uh, Bible studies and conversations. Well, we call them Bible studies. Uh, they had the Old Testament scriptures, some of the New Testament was still being written, so they didn't have everything that we have, but they were still studying God's Word, and uh, they were having uh, small group meetings, I think is the term for it now. Uh, so, uh, all during this time, there were witnesses to the things that the Apostle had shared, and it was true that nothing ever changed. The Word of God does not change. The truth of the Word of God does not change. And he said, all those things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou, and it's the same thought that we had seen in chapter 1, that God had deposited, uh, that he had deposited with God uh, his life's affairs. Now he says, you deposit these things as a trust. You commit these things as a trust to trustworthy, trusty men who shall be able to teach others also. They'll be capable, qualified to teach others also. So continually invest in making skilled propagators of the true gospel. Now I think sometimes uh, we as church, well many times we as churches have failed in this very respect. Now please don't misunderstand me. The importance of evangelism cannot be understated. And we need to be constantly preaching and teaching to people that you need to be saved from your sins. And without that, you're going to perish in your sins. You'll end up eternally apart from God in a place of torment. That's the truth. 
And the only way to be saved from your sins is to repent. Change your mind about continuing on in your sin and your unbelief. And put your faith in Jesus Christ to be your Savior from sin because of who He is and what He's done for you in His death, burial, and resurrection. His shed blood. And if you have repented of your sin and placed your complete dependence upon Jesus Christ to save you from your sin today, I would plead with you. Do so. Jesus died for your sins. He took the punishment for your sins in your place. He shed His blood for your cleansing. He was buried and He rose again and He will give eternal life to all who believe in Him. We should never neglect that message. But that is not the completeness of the gospel. And the true gospel goes beyond that into sanctification and, and uh, service and daily living and looking forward to glorification and glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. And many times in churches what we've done is we've continually over and over and over and over and over again have given evangelistic messages and teaching but have failed to get into deeper truths of the Word of God to give the fullness of the true gospel. The Apostle Paul said, I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. Now, the Apostle Paul says, this is what's going to be the normal from now on of getting the gospel out. We're not going to have the apostles around anymore, so uh, here's how it's going to happen. You equip trustworthy leaders for multiplication ministry. You train up trusty men. Number one, to become pastors, missionaries, Bible school educators, Christian material publishers, Christian material authors, etc. Definitely you need to equip people to be the spiritual leaders and teachers. And that would include especially your pastoral positions and your teaching positions of spiritual things. And, and so you need all of these positions. You need trusty people. Now, not everybody's going to fill that role. Not everybody's trustworthy enough for that. Or uh, maybe not at the moment you can't trust them with that. Maybe they're too novice in their faith. And they need time to grow and to be taught. So it is your responsibility to equip them. So the local church, if at all possible, should be training, equipping trusty people to go into the ministry. Now many of our churches have found that we, we just don't have all of the resources or the ability to do it all on our own. So, Bible schools and things have been formed, and, and they help out in that respect. It's still the local church's responsibility, but uh, if we can't take care of it all of our, uh, by ourselves, it's important that we help find ways for these people to get the training they need. Now, if you're going to do that, it's important that you go to a Bible school or seminary, whatever it is, a Bible institute that is true to the Word of God. Now, I have to say something here. More and more of the Bible colleges throughout the years have drifted away from the truths of the Word of God. And there aren't that many good Bible schools anymore. So you need to be real careful. If you're going to get trained into the ministry where you end up going to get your training. 
I think one of the things that churches ought to consider is consider investing in that education for those who are going into the ministry. You know it's expensive to go to college. Private colleges are even more expensive. And I tell you what, churches, if they're going to encourage people to get trained up to go into the ministry, perhaps they ought to consider helping to support those who go to those schools. It's not only pastors, though. Engage trustworthy disciples in multiplication ministry. It's very important that the spiritual leaders, the pastors, missionaries, and so forth, the publishers, and all of those are trained up. But really, there ought to be trust people in the church that ought to be engaged in multiplication ministry. See, I think a, a, a lot of times we failed here in thinking that the pastor or pastors in the church are the ones that are responsible for doing all of this, uh, leading people to Christ and then discipling them. And discipling is the thought. You go back to Matthew and it says, uh, Go ye therefore, baptizing them and first it's conversion the, the main command is teaching them which means to make converts out of them baptizing them while going while baptizing and then it says in another Greek word teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you that's the area of discipleship we get stuck on evangelism, but very little discipleship. And this is sometimes because it's all placed upon the pastor or pastor's shoulders. That's his job. Really, if a church wants to continually see the spread of the gospel, the people in the pew need to get involved. Now, again, not everybody's qualified to do uh, a lot. Uh, new believers need training up first. Uh, but uh, there are some people that have been in the pews for years that have been taught and taught and taught and taught and taught the truths that really should get involved in helping to disciple others. Now, we call this multiplication ministry. Let me try to illustrate to you what I mean. Let's take a five-year period. And let's say that I, the pastor, lead one soul to Jesus Christ per year and then disciple that soul. In five years, how many souls will have been one in disciple? This is simple math. Even me, I can do this. How many? In five years, one a year, how many? Five. Now that would be terrific. That would. Uh, even if one soul is saved, praise God. Amen? Amen. And you disciple that soul even better. But here's what happens in multiplication ministry. Now I'll try not to lose you here. Let's say that I win one soul and disciple him. In the first year, we would have one. Let's say then the next year, year two. I win another soul and disciple them, but the one soul that I won last year has been discipled to win another one who will be able to teach others also. So that one soul wins another one and disciples him. So in year two, 
you have the one soul that was won the first year, the one soul I win again, and the one soul that he or she wins. So in year two, how many do you have? Three. Already one more than it would have been if it was just the pastor, right? Ooh, you start to catch on here. All right. Year three. You would have those first three. Okay. Plus the one that I win again in Disciple. Plus the three that those initial three win in Disciple. How many do you have? You've already beat the pastor doing it himself in five years, haven't you? On year three. Year four, you have seven plus the one I win and disciple, and seven more that are one and discipled. How many do you have? Fifteen. Oh, you've already tripled. Year, that was year four. Year five, you have 15 plus the one I win again and disciple, and the 15 they win and disciple. So in year five, you have 31 as compared to five. Now, if it worked this way consistently, and you go to 10 years, you know how many souls would have been one and disciple? 1,023. You know how many souls would have been one and discipled if it was one for the pastor every year in 10 years? 10. We're pretty poor mathematicians, aren't we? Listen, don't depend on or wait on only the pastor or pastors to win souls to Christ and disciple them if you know the truths of the gospel. You know, you can do small groups, you can do Bible studies, get involved in teaching uh, your Sunday schools and things. You can pass on these truths. Uh, maybe we won't be able to win one soul and disciple them completely in a year. I, I gave that as an illustration, but still it would magnify what God would do if those who are capable got involved in discipleship. Get involved in evangelism and discipleship. And if you're not prepared or qualified to teach these truths, get prepared. Find somebody to help you learn these truths and prepare you. Now, you see, one of the things that's been my goal throughout my ministry is not to just get stuck on evangelism alone, but to give you deeper truths from the Word of God. And hopefully over these years, by the way, in August, I'll have finished 16 years here. Hopefully in those years, you've got enough of a background in the truths of the Word of God that you should be able to take these things and teach others also. And if, you, if you're waiting to get prepared, in the meantime, share the truths you do know for sure and just make sure you don't make up things on your own lest you share a false gospel. I tell you what, if you're a brand new Christian, you can at least tell people, I know this, this is how you get saved from sin. You turn from your sin and you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Now you can do that and you can give your testimony. Listen, in closing today, I would say this. Become a true and faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. And also a disciple maker for Jesus Christ. One of the things that maybe you could do is to pray on a consistent basis. Lord, give me a soul 
lay that soul as a burden upon my heart that I will continually pray for that soul to come to know the Lord Jesus and become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Father, I do pray that if there's a soul listening today that doesn't know Jesus as Savior, that they'll put their faith in Christ to be their Savior from sin. And I pray that you would keep us all from being satisfied with just that. You have so much more that you want to do in our lives, through our lives, and for your glory. Help us to grow and be strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And make us disciple makers. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In closing, let's sing this final song, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. 619. If you need to be saved today and you want some help, you come as we sing. Stand up for Jesus. Let's stand. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto Thank you for being here today. Uh, I would remind you, no services this evening. Please be safe out there. Some of us are going to be traveling into Minnesota. The rest of you pray for us. Pray for anybody else that gets in our way. And uh, we'll see you, Lord willing, this Wednesday or next Sunday. Let's close, please, in a word of prayer. Lanny, would you close us, please?